oh yeah, sing is king, this is the thing, do you know what I mean? Thank you. 
Good afternoon. I, I am so pleased to join all of you. I want to begin by again thanking CC uh, and his inc incredible vision to continue to gather us all together so that we can enhance the participation of not only Asian Pacific Islander Americans in the governmental, public policy, and private sector communities, but to involve all communities. Because if we want California to prosper, we need to make sure that not only do we increase Asian Pacific American Islander participation, but we lift the prospects and hopes and opportunities for all Californians and eventually all Americans. I was asked, I was asked to share with you uh, for, for five minutes what's happening with California's finances. Uh, as the state treasurer, I am your banker. So I take on Wall Street, I take on others on behalf of the 38.8 million Californians. So let me share a little bit about the prospects of what has taken place in 2015. So as we remember, just a few years ago, in 2008, 2009, our great state was in deep financial trouble. Over a period of time, we had built up over a $30 billion cash deficit. We, had, we owed tens of billions of dollars in budgetary deficits. We had to take three important measures. And those three important measures by you and your fellow Californians have put California back on the right fiscal track. Now, if you, let me go over those measures. Yes, this is why your participation is very important. If you remember, we used to have projected budgets. Budgets routinely were not signed on time here in California. The political differences that we witnessed today in Washington, D.C., unfortunately still occurred here in California. And so a, couple, a few years ago, we had a budget that was 85 days late. That was in 2008. A couple of years later, we had a budget that was 100 days late. It impacted California's credit ratings. Education communities were being impacted. Healthcare providers weren't being paid timely or in full amounts. And so devastation was occurring in our communities in the period of time that we were having great economic difficulty. So the first measure that you took, you passed Proposition 25. And by passing Proposition 25, it reduced the voter threshold from a two-thirds majority to 50% plus one to pass a budget. Since the passage of that measure, we have had five on-time budgets in the state of California. The second measure you passed was Proposition 30. It was a tax increase, both for income taxes and sales tax. Now, let's think back to why we did that. Governor Brown gave the voters of California a choice. You can either pass Proposition 30, or if we did not pass Proposition 30, we were gonna to have to reduce school funding. Why? When you think about, think about what we spend your general fund tax dollars on. What are the general fund tax dollars? Those are the personal income taxes you pay, they're the sales taxes that you pay, and it's the corporation, corporate taxes that are paid. Revenues were weak. In California, 1.34 million Californians lost their jobs, obviously bringing in less revenues. But kids still have to go to school. Seniors and the disabled and special needs still need health care services. And we care about public safety, so we had to maintain public safety services. So the governor said either we cut the school year, well, we're going to cut the school budget, which would have been a reduction for many school dist districts by about 15 days. And the voters of California well understood that California kids, relative to kids in other countries, go to school for less days. If we want our kids to get a world-class education, they obviously need a world high-quality education, and they need to be in school. So the voters of California made a very difficult decision to pass those tax increases. This is what has happened. At that time in 2012, before the vote, 188 school districts were in negative or qualified certification, meaning negative certification, cash flow problems in the next 12 months. Qualified certification, cash flow problems in the next three years. Since the passage of Proposition 30, the number of school districts in trouble in the state of California has dropped from 188, educating 3 million of California's K-12 through 
3 million of California's 6.25 million K through 12 students dropped to below 40 school districts in financial trouble. So you have stabilized the education finances temporarily for the state of California. And then the third measure that you passed was Proposition 2 in last November's election. It provided, and we all need to do this, a rainy day fund. We all know that you have to save money for bad times. Because for those of us who took economics and finance, we, we just have to go back to our basic lessons. There are business cycles, there are times when businesses are doing well, and there are times when businesses are not performing well. There are monetary cycles, there are commodity cycles, and when you get a down cycle, you have problems like we witnessed in 2008, 9, 10, when we actually have 12.5% unemployment rate in the state of California. It's down to just slightly above 6%. So that's the progress that we're making. Now, in the Treasurer's Office, I work on the economics and the finances of this state, as in my prior position, but I work on external finances. So I ask all of you to think about how you can improve the financial condition of your life. So little things such as, it's time for all of us who have a loved one who's young and you want to have a better future, start to save money for their college education. I'll give you a simple example. My parents immigrated to this country from Taiwan. And when they came to this country in the early 1950s, and I was born in 62, the oldest child, as they wanted, my, they wanted me and my brothers and my sister to get an education. So they used to take us to the bank nearly weekly and they deposit a dollar a week. And then as my dad made more money, my mom took care of us full time, they deposit $2 a week. Then they deposit $3 a week. Now if I was born 17 years ago in the state of California and my parents had that same habit, $4 a week, today, and I, I was entering college today, they would have paid for the entire fees for a community college education in the state of California. Imagine that, give up one Frappuccino a week and put your, get your child a community college degree in the state of California, right? That's the powerful difference that a small habit can make. So if you're interested, we run the scholarship program out of the treasurer's office. Secondly, I am working on housing. For the first time in California history, the ratings agencies have stated that they're concerned about the lack of access to affordable housing. A few rich people have moved out of the state because of taxes, but more people are moving out of the state of California because we don't have accessible, affordable housing. It's an economic danger for the young people in the state of California. And so I'm working on rewriting the rules and regulations and trying to create partnerships amongst the community, coming up with better ideas so that we can create affordable housing for the homeless, for special needs, for seniors, and for young people. I also house a lot of economic development authorities. So whether you are opening a taco truck or you're opening the next Tesla, we have a whole bunch of grant, loan, and credit support programs in the treasurer's office. One of the things we have to figure out in California and America, and it's a discussion that happens all across the globe, is what is the next major industry that replaces the loss of jobs in manufacturing? That's the middle class of California and America. So we want to help finance your ideas so that we can create economic prosperity all across the board in California. And then last, I work on your retirement. Nearly half the baby boom generation in this country does not have adequate savings for their retirement. We want people that actually aspire and have their golden years. So I'm working uh, on Kevin DeLeon's legislation to make sure that we come up with alternative plans to create for the 7.5 million Californians to do not have an employer-based retiree plan so that we can put that in place. So in the treasurer's office, I hope those of you who are inspired to create better ideas, better communities, better friendships for a more prosperous future 
or work with my office or any of the other great elected officials or appointed officials that you saw earlier today because it only coming together are we going to make sure that we can create the state that really recognizes the promise and prosperity that is indeed the golden ideal of California. Thank you very much, Apapa. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our Perspectives on Accelerating Our Movement Forward panel, moderated by Ms. Sharon Ito. Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> Other than tripping on the stage just a few seconds ago, I'm doing fine. Thank you for coming to the APAPA Education Forum. And we have four gentlemen here that we have questions of. So we want to continue our discussion so that you know what the issues are. This panel specifically perspectives on accelerating um, movement forward for a pop-up. So let's go ahead and start. We want to go ahead and do introductions and say hello. We have treasurer here, John Chung. How are you? We have next to him assemblyman, uh, excuse me, former assembly member, now Senator Richard Pan. How are you? Next, we have assembly member, Jim Cooper. Hello. And then Congress member Ted Liu, how are you? So I guess the way we're going to run this is you have microphones, right, on the sofa. So we're going to ask these questions and then each gentleman will then have, we're looking at about a one minute response, okay? So our first question, what barriers have you personally faced in the political arena as a result of your ethnicity and how you have overcome them? So let's go ahead and start uh, with Treasurer Chung. So when, when I became involved in public service in 1988 uh, here in the state of California, I quickly realized that the Asian Pacific American Islander community wasn't, uh, was not active. Uh, they didn't have meaningful membership, and they certainly weren't leaders in many of the infrastructural organizations that were critical to moving uh, the interests of this community and others along. So I just decided to volunteer, and ultimately others decided to volunteer, so that today we've created that infrastructure. What's very important is that we build that pipeline, Asian Americans in business leadership, Asian Americans in environmental community, Asians in labor, Asians in NGOs. By building those partnerships, by getting access to the resources, by getting the attention of others, we can develop meaningful policies. Thank you, Treasurer. Senator. Senator so Penn. I would say we have both what I call internal and external. Internal, as a child of immigrants, my uh, parents uh, certainly didn't expect any of us to go into politics. In fact, discouraged it in the sense that they felt that anyone who looked and sounded like us would never be elected. Uh, so there, I think there's a part of, uh, if you're an immigrant or you're a child of immigrants, that uh, people may not necessarily be encouraged to uh, consider running for public office. Certainly the idea of becoming president was not in the uh, sight for me when I was growing up because there was no way we'd ever succeed in something like politics where we would be judged by uh, our appearance and, uh, and where we came from. Uh, at the same time, when I say externally, 
when I first ran for office, actually decided to actually take the leap, uh, there were people who said that an Asian couldn't win in that district uh, when I ran. And actually, interesting enough, the person who proved that wrong is the man sitting next to me right here, uh, our state treasurer at the time when he ran for state controller. He had actually won the district in his statewide race, and we were able to use that to prove to people that, yes, someone in API can win in this district. Uh, but yet, there were people who said that they couldn't win and therefore said people should not, we should, I should not be nominated. And so thankfully, uh, we have people uh, leading the way like uh, our state treasurer and others uh, here as well. Uh, but we have both those internal and external, so I would certainly encourage people who are interested in public office, please do so. Please do so, we need more candidates. And also, that we also need to send a stronger message to people, and I think we've demonstrated many different races that uh, Asian Pacific Islanders can win races, especially since our community isn't, isn't a majority in many districts. So many people go, well, it's not an Asian seat, as they say. But uh, we, we've demonstrated we can win those uh, districts as well uh, by working hard and, and talking about our stories. Thank you, uh, Senator. Sam Lumen Cooper, what um, barriers have you faced? It started about 30 years ago in 1984 when I joined the Sheriff's Department. There were less than 12 African-Americans African in the department, even less API members, and it rose through the ranks to become a rank of captain, and then was the first African-American mayor in the Sacramento region, the city of Elk Grove. And back then, Elk Grove was not very diverse, and I spent 15 years in the council and won the assembly seat last year. So it's always been tough, especially coming from law enforcement and not a lot of minorities in law enforcement. I look at API and the Sheriff's Department and just two have attained the rank of captain or higher. So there's still issues looming in law enforcement uh, for folks like that. But definitely, it was, I think it was a plus, and sometimes it was, it was minuses, but overall, we need more diversity in our law enforcement ranks and political ranks around Sacramento. Look around the region and think about who your leaders are on a local level. Not a lot of diversity. Congressman. Thank you. Let me first thank CCE and the Board of Apaba for putting on this uh, tremendous event today. Uh, we have an amazing country, uh, but our country has had blind spots. And one of them is, in terms of race and ethnicity, uh, we had the whole yellow peril earlier in our country's history, followed by the Alien Land Laws and the Chinese Exclusion Act. Our country then interned over 100,000 Americans simply because they were of Japanese descent. That was followed by the Wen Ho Lee cases, and more recently now, cases against uh, Asian Americans who were uh, uh, indicted for spying only have those charges dropped. And so there is sort of a perception among some people, among some folks in America, among some folks in our government, that people who look like you and me are somehow not Americans or second class citizens. And so we're fighting back against that and that's one of the issues that I've worked on. I know it's one of the issues that Papa has worked on and I look forward to working with all of you uh, to challenge those stereotypes. Our next question, thank you. For ethnic communities to move forward, they must know and understand how national and world issues affect them locally. What efforts are you making or have you made to bring your constituents on board regarding key national and world issues like economy, jobs, education, environment, et cetera? Let's go ahead and start with the uh, Senator, Senator Pan. Well, I, I think that uh in terms of uh, trying to educate people about what's going around the world, that is something that uh, certainly we try to do working with various organizations. That's why organizations like APAPA are so very important uh, because this organization helps have forums like this one where we can talk about these particular issues. But in addition, what's also important is not just being aware or knowing about the issues, but actually being able to organize our community to actually make a difference in these issues, to shape the events and not simply learn about them. And that's why, again, this organization and many others are so important because what we need to do is think about, you know, we need to know what's, what's going on around the world, how, how it's impacting us, but then also how do we change that and how do we get more people from our community and how do we create more diverse leaderships in, in, in government, in business, uh, in nonprofits and many other places, and how, how can we as a community come together to try to move to, to actually set the agenda and move that agenda forward? So uh, certainly, it's very important to talk about issues, and uh, and there's uh, and organizations can help uh, spread those things. But it's even equally important then to take the next step is to have people step forward to figure out how do we then uh, bring our perspective and be sure that uh, we actually shape the events, not merely just learn about them. Assemblyman Cooper. 
it's, it's an education process to educate those folks because there's so many benefits out there and we aren't doing enough for communities of color. Uh, most recently, legislature passed legislation to make health care for all, whether you're an immigrant or not. And that was an important piece of legislation that came out of the Senate. And just things like that to inform people and bring up leaders. There are so many young leaders out there that can do a great job in mentoring. What are our next group of leaders to come up? Um, it's funny because we weren't elected from largely immigrant districts or Asian districts. So it's that mass voter appeal, getting out there and choosing those right candidates. And I tell my staffers, it's okay to be ambitious, to want to succeed and climb up and do something about it. And really reaching those voters and telling them what services are available. It doesn't matter your income. There are lots of programs for college, for a variety of programs that our kids can get engaged in. And it's so important to reach out there, especially with communities of color, black and brown and Asian and API. We've got to change that and educate them as much as we can. We're doing a good job. We can do a better job, though. Uh, both, both Congress and the California State Legislature are in two-year legislative cycles. And when I was in the California State Senate, uh, every two years I would vote about 5,000 times. And on those 5,000 plus bills, 80 some percent, I did not get a single phone call, a single email, a single fax, or a single meeting. So when you go and meet with your legislators, whether it's in Washington, D.C. or Sacramento, or when you call in or you send an email or you send a fax, it does have an effect on us. It has an effect on my staff, it has an effect on me, we were wondering why are all these people now writing in about this particular issue? It makes us focus on it. Uh, so that's one way you can affect change. Another way is if you see an issue that really offends you, write a letter to the editor. And you'll be surprised uh, after a while if you keep on doing that, you're going to get published. And you can affect change that way. Uh, there are lots of ways to get involved. You can join campaigns. You can uh, intern in different places. And uh, afterwards, come up to me if you're interested in a political or judicial appointment or uh, at the state or federal level, let me or any of the API caucus members know, uh, or your assembly member, and they will help you. I actually like to follow up on Ted's earlier comment. I want to give a lot of kudos to Ted for publicly speaking out about a lot of the investigations that aren't fully baked, uh, not well based in regards to investigations against Chinese American scientists. Uh, Ted's been a national leader in speaking out for that. So, Ted, thank you uh, in that particular regard. Uh, what, I, what I like about the... Yes. What I enjoy about serving on this panel with my colleagues uh, here is that all of them are incredibly active in their community. They're accessible, they're intelligent, they want to engage in increasing uh, democratic participation in the institutions in California. Uh, and so they're accessible to making sure that the values, that the uh, observations, and the best thoughts of their local residents are brought to bear. And so when I served on the Board of Equalization, which was my pu first public office, I used to attend more than 900 public events because I wanted to make sure that I was working on the issues, that I was accessible, that, that we can make particular change. Now, the districts we all represent are incredibly large. So one of the things that we use is that we also use technology. So some of you know that I posted government employees' websites uh, because not everybody can check against the excesses that happen in the city of Bell. I started posting the finances of local government because you have a lot of really terrific communities, more importantly, the people in those communities. But it just can't be the state officials who are checking if a city like Vallejo runs into financial difficulty or Mammoth Lakes. It's local leadership. So what we try to do is do our work, but empower through access to the information and knowledge that we have so that you can help govern your local communities, build the partnerships uh, that change our future. Thank you. Our next question regards business and the economy. Small business owners are still the backbone to our economy, and many ethnic minorities are small business owners. What efforts or plans have you designed or implemented to support small businesses and to give them access to more capital. Small business truly is the backbone of most business in California. It's not big corporations. And it's so important as legislators that we pass laws that make it easier to do business here in California and don't burden those businesses. And a lot of them are minority owned. And it's so important in my district, we had a Google workshop and a Facebook workshop on how to grow your business. It's so important. Go business on small business loans and um, one on Yahoo. And it's critical that we do as much as we can. 
and, and being a moderate Democrat, I'm a business Democrat. How can we grow business? If business is growing and flourishing, folks will spend money. They will hire and create jobs. And it's so important to walk that fine line and balance that to make sure we help business as much as we can. And I see the, the pendulum swing in California where it's becoming more business friendly because for a long time, it wasn't business friendly. It was tax, tax, tax. And as business owners, you know, that's not a good formula. I grew up, I grew up in a small business. Uh, my parents uh, immigrated to the U.S. to seek the American dream. And uh, when they came here, they were poor and they didn't speak English well. And we uh, grew up, uh, basically they went to flea markets and sold gifts and jewelry. But over many years, they were able to uh, expand to six gift stores in uh, shopping malls. And it was always very clear to me that having a small business is very difficult and government uh, at the very least, uh, if we can't help, we should first do no harm. Uh, but there are things that government can do to help. One way is to make sure that uh, we uh, increase and solidify the small business loans uh, that are offered by the SBA. Uh, we also, right now in Congress, are trying to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank. Uh, even though big businesses benefit from that, the overwhelming majority of beneficiaries of the Export-Import Bank are small businesses. Uh, just last week, we were able to uh, get a bill uh, through what's called a discharge position uh, onto their uh, floor that will be uh, voted on later this month, and hopefully we can get that reauthorized. Uh, in addition to the programs, in addition to the programs that I mentioned when I was giving my remarks, uh, when I was at the Board of Equalization, it continues today, I started free tutorials for small businesses because I didn't want you to become overwhelmed by the complexity of the tax code. Uh, between the federal and state tax code, there are 10 million words, and it's really easy to make a mistake. And those mistakes can be devastating uh, in, in regards to just the existence of those businesses. So if you are starting a business that has some implications with the Board of Equalization, contact your representative, uh, and we, they do them in different languages. So I wanted to make sure that we were accessible, especially to immigrant communities. So when I was the Board of Equalization members, we did it in Korean, we did it in Thai, we did it in uh, Cantonese, uh, we did it for our Armenian community, and so you can get those safe harbor protections. Secondly, uh, next year, or targeted for next year, what I'm trying to do with the 14 economic development agencies that I chair as the state treasurer, I'm trying to create an Amazon website because you coming to me and trying to understand all the financing rules is far too complicated. Uh, I want this to be a model for all the government at some point. So you come and tell me that you are opening a restaurant like C.C. Yin when he first came to this country. He has Board of Equalization, he has Secretary of State, he has Franchise Tax Board, he has local government, he has all these requirements. The, if you come to my website next year in the winter, what we want to do is you tell us what type of business you're starting, we'll say, do you do this, right? And we will, if you say yes, we will say, we have this credit support program, we have this loan program, we have these other types of programs to assist you. Because we want to make it in the treasurer's office a one-shop stop. Ultimately, I'd love to see it for government to have a one-shop stop to say, if you're going to do this, these are all the programs and requirements you have to do business in the state of California. So, um, you know, my family, we're small business owners. Uh, my wife is a dentist. We have uh, started the dental practice from scratch. I know that, in fact, many people in our community, many immigrants start their own businesses, sometimes because it's hard to advance uh, in another business, right? Uh, sometimes people face discrimination and they're not able to advance and people don't think of them as being so-called management or CEO material. So they said, I'm going to strike out on my own, start my own business. And we need to help work with uh, people who, want to, who are starting their own business to help them succeed and grow. And so certainly as a small business owner, I know that uh, you know, we have to borrow the money that the owner's the last one to get paid. And sometimes if the books are negative, you don't get paid at all. You worked all month, your staff, you know, you meet payroll first, you get what's left. Uh, at the same time, uh, when you deal with the government, uh, you try to do the right thing. And uh, I think it's very important we try to simplify the complexity. And I appreciate what uh, my colleagues here are trying to do to help, uh, help small business owners. Because as I said, my wife's a dentist. She said, you know, I, I want to take care, focus on providing the best dental care I can. But I'm also the HR person. I'm also the, you know, the, the, the environmental person and everything else. And 
sometimes it's hard to keep track of all the rules, right? I mean, my specialty, my, my training is in dentistry. And uh, so we need to help small businesses be able to, to, to who want to do the right thing. The ones who actually are you know, acting in good faith, trying to do the right thing, to be sure that they're able to do that, that they're not going to get harassed uh, if, if they make a small mistake, that they're unknowingly, that they have the opportunity to try to address those things. At the same time, I also mentioned that as a small business owner, I also know that you need customers. And that's why I think it's so important that I know all of us here have been working to grow the middle class because we need to grow the middle class so there's more customers for small businesses so you can actually sell more. And that's also very important too. And that's one of the things that I'm also fighting for, for to be sure we grow the middle class so there are more customers, people who can buy the goods and services not only my wife but every other small business owner wants to sell. And that's uh, also part of how we make our economy grow. We need to help small businesses and we also need to grow the middle class. And through that, that's how we make our economy succeed. Can I ask the audience if you could raise your hand and perhaps the gentleman can see how many of you are immigrants or uh, your parents or grandparents were immigrants? A lot of hands going up. So this question, immigration policy is an area that greatly affects immigrant communities such as those in this room. How would you fix our current immigration system? And we'll start with the congressman. Thank you. Uh, I support comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, the bill that passed the U.S. Senate uh, last term had three components. Uh, one, it was going to strengthen our borders, uh, which I support. It was also going to increase the number of uh, applicants avail uh, and slots available for folks who come in through H-1B visas and other kinds of visas. And it was going to provide a pathway to citizenship for the people who are already here who are undocumented. Uh, if a version of that bill were to be put on the floor of the United States House of Representatives, uh, it would pass with bipartisan support. Uh, unfortunately, you have uh, this uh, Tea Party caucus within the Republican caucus that's uh, very extreme, and they've been holding that bill up. And as a result, we haven't been able to move forward. Uh, my hope is that after 2016 presidential elections, uh, that that bill will uh, appear on the, on the House floor. And when it does, uh, we will have comprehensive immigration reform. So, so I concur with Ted at the, at the federal level as to requiring comprehensive immigration reform, looking at work patterns, looking at family patterns. Historically, you used to see massive debates about country preferences. Uh, that's part of the reason that you used to have discrimination against uh, certain immigrants from uh, various, various countries. Uh, at, at, at a local or state level, I think in California, we need to look at what's taking place in places such as Nashville, Tennessee, how when you have immigrants come into this country, come into your particular jurisdiction, uh, state to local levels, what types of programs, how do you integrate them into society, especially in regards to business efforts. At the federal level, there's a small business administration effort trying to tie immigrants as to better understanding as to what are the economic patterns so that in the event that they want to create businesses, the programs at the SBA are available. So we have a whole host of programs uh, available in the state, making sure that we can integrate them into society as quickly as possible so that they can have a productive uh, professional and personal life uh, in whatever community they reside in. Well, I certainly agree with our con good congressman. Uh, I'm glad to thank you so very much for your leadership, uh, Congressman Lou, for, 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 uh, on immigration reform. And you know, we, 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 need a pat we need comprehensive immigration reform. And we certainly at the state, uh, in the absence of uh, federal effort, because unfortunately there is a, uh, a minority that's blocking uh, action at the federal level, we've done what we can here in California to make California more welcoming to immigrants. Because we recognize here in California that immigrants are an asset, and, uh, and immigrants uh, help actually stimulate our, our economy, stimulate our state, uh, makes our state a better place. Uh, when we think about all the businesses that have been opened uh, by, uh, by immigrants uh, and what that's been able to do for our state, and so certainly we've worked hard here in California to pass laws to be more welcoming to immigrants and recognizing the contributions they make. Uh, frankly, I have to say that I'm very disturbed by the rhetoric that's been happening this presidential election, uh, particularly, unfortunately, on the uh, opposite party side. 
uh, with uh, proclamations that we're just going to deport everybody. And uh, actually, unfortunately, uh, establishment candidate uh, by name of Bush said that anchor babies were Asians. He wasn't talking. I mean, that, that's very disturbing uh, that that kind of rhetoric is, is going on. Uh, I, ho I call on whether, you know, Democrat or Republican, I think it's important that we stand up together and say that immigrants contribute to the economy and we're not going to put up with that kind of rhetoric. That's not going to be acceptable here in the United States of America. I don't envy Ted being in Congress. It's, it's good to be a Democrat here and to be in the majority party in California. It's a great thing. Um, I also think, as far as immigration goes, we've done a lot here in our legislature, um, health care. Your immigrant status doesn't matter. You will get health care, especially children here in California. Driver's licenses. You can get a driver's license here in California. So in some regards, California actually leads the nation on immigrant issues, and we're doing more. And it's, it's really so important, as Dr. Pan said, those folks do pay taxes. They are productive citizens. They contribute a lot to California and our nation. And hopefully we can get beyond this and have a meaningful dialogue on this issue. Because it's time, and folks keep dragging it out and don't really address the real issue. We have our next question, gentlemen. What do you feel is our state and nation's greatest challenge? And we'll start with the treasurer. I think it's uh, creating world-class education for every child. I think once a child has an education, they can be resilient to all the challenges. We have huge economic challenges. We have huge health care challenges. We have financial challenges. Uh, but if you give a child a world-class education, hopefully it blossoms, it flowers into greater opportunities. Now, that being said, it's really important that we create the relationships. The relationships in your life, whether it's economic studies, whether it's human management, whether it's sociology, they impact your financial and emotional happiness. So keep up the work, of a, up the work uh, that you're doing here in APAPA Right, because that's how you address the challenges for the 21st century. Senator? Well, I, I have to agree with uh, our, our good state treasurer that certainly education and opportunity for education is, uh, is, is going to be fundamental to try and address, I'd say, the disparities we have in our society. Uh, so as we look at uh, our, our, our community and our society, um, we can see that, uh, uh, unfortunately, whether it's based on your zip code or your race or ethnicity, you can have very different outcomes in terms of your health, your education, your, uh, few, your, your opportunities for life. And uh, we need to try to work together to reduce those disparities. I think it's very important that we as the API community work closely with our uh, good friends and colleagues in the Latino and uh, African American and Native American uh, communities as well, and also, with, of course, with uh, the mainstream uh, uh, as well. That, in fact, sometimes people have looked at our communities being, quote, the model minority, and I think many of us uh, understand the model minority myth. Uh, and in fact, when you look at uh, what uh, the API community has to face, uh, first of all, we're not monolithic, uh, but even when people say, oh, look, Asians do so well, same time, we notice that very few uh, API are uh, in uh, senior management or CEO positions, no matter what field, I'll tell you in my own field of medicine, you look at medical school admissions, people go, oh, look, there's a bunch of Asians in medical school. Uh, and admittedly, I think we're short on some Asians, we're, certain on, uh, we're short on some of the particular Pacific Islanders, and then when you look at physicians and medical school faculty, you say, oh, look at all of them. There's actually more than the percentage in the population. If you look at department chairs and medical school faculty, falls right off. And you know, there's a hundred, over 140 uh, uh, medical schools in the United States, you know, you realize it's not a single API medical school dean in the United States of America. What is going on? What is going on here? And I think, uh, so, uh, I think what that speaks to is that sometimes people say, well, the API community doesn't have the same challenges as some of the other minority groups do. But actually, we do. We may have it at different places, but we do have those challenges, and we all need to work together uh, with every, together to try to address these disparities. Uh, so that's just one example, but I think that, that is something that I think that uh, a challenge our community should uh, take up and, be and, and again, work together, to figure out how do we be sure that everyone has the same opportunity to succeed, no matter what race or ethnicity, no matter which part of the geography they come from, and that we're going to address, that we're going to work together to address those things. Uh, the economy is the big issue. 
the, the gap between haves and have-nots has grown exponentially over the years. And that's, that's really a big issue. In my district, you look at schools, Title I schools, a lot of kids, kids of color, API, African-American, Latino, are on reduced or free breakfast, lunch, and dinner even in schools. Folks are having a hard time putting food on the table and getting by. We're squeezing out the middle class and the lower income folks. It is tough getting by, and that's the hard part. Communities of color, we've got to do more with that and bring jobs and education. And that's the toughest part. You look at these communities, communities of color, what do they have? Underperforming schools, no banks, no supermarkets, no arts programs or sports programs for kids. We are failing our children. Those tools are available. Until we do a better job, and, and folks want to talk about everything else but those issues, and think about your worst community where you live at, your worst community. It's been that way for 40, 50, 60 years. We can do sequel exemptions and build stadiums and do revitalize downtown, but what are we doing for our young kids? That's the challenge, absolutely nothing. And we've got to do a better job at that. Invest in that, and I'll tell you what, crime drops and a lot of your other issues will fall to the wayside. But until that investment happens, it's not going to change. Thank you. Uh, I agree with the panelists that uh, growing our economy for all Americans and increasing educational opportunities for all Americans is what we need to do to move America forward. Uh, but in the long term, I think there's only one issue that can kill us as a species if we don't do something about it, and that's climate change. We do know that uh, we can measure the effects of climate change. We know that last year was the hottest year in recorded history, only to be outdone by the first six months of this year. We know that in the last century, our ocean levels have risen 6.7 inches, and now it's accelerating in the last decade. We know our snowpacks are melting. We know we have more extreme weather events than ever before. If we don't start doing way more things about climate change, your children, your grandchildren are going to live in a much worse environment, and some of them are going to die because of it. So I think that's the one issue that all of us uh, as a society have to tackle. Thank you. What do you think can be done to accelerate the movement forward of ethnic minorities into the political arena over the next few years? And we'll start with uh, Senator Pan. So I, th I think, uh, sir, going back to where we started in this panel, it's really about uh, organizing. It's uh, uh, organizations like APAPA. Uh, we need more organizations, uh, people who venues by which we can organize ourselves. I think as, uh, as, uh, as our treasurer says, John Chung said, my own experience, I'm sure, you know, their experiences. I mean, what happens is that when you're trying to run for the first time for leadership or if you're trying to get, uh, if you're trying to get promoted, uh, if you don't have people who can help support you, some of us are gonna have to be the first one. I mean, I'm the first API legislator to represent uh, the, in the state legislature. We've, I had other people ahead of me in, in Congress and other in my area to, to represent uh, Sacramento. Uh, that you know, we need, there needs to be, we need to build that infrastructure and we need that support. And so I think that, again, APAPA plays an extremely important role. And APAPA has, not only has this uh, forum and has the various chapters, but the internships, which then give opportunities for young people to learn more about what the pathway is. If, if I ever asked my parents, how do I get into politics, they'd probably look at me blankly and say, well, I have no idea, I don't think it's a good idea. Right, so you need to have other people who can say, hey, look, you know, I want to be just like Ted Lieu, and that's why I want to be in Congress. And someone says, there actually is a Ted Lieu in Congress, and there's actually a pathway. I may not know how to get there, but let's talk to Ted, or to Dr. Chung, or uh, to Jim Cooper. Uh, you know, that, that, I think that's really important, and that we need to have organized ways of doing that as well, and, and have that infrastructure. And then for the people who actually do it, we need to have the support to make that happen. Uh, because that's what people turn around, they go, okay, well, what support are you going to get from you know, the API community, your API. And if there isn't that infrastructure there, it can be done, but it's much, much harder. And so uh, that's why I'm so appreciative of what CC Young Yen has done and the people, leaders of APAPA uh, in, 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 or, in this organization, and also uh, many other API who have stepped up and said it's time to organize and to, to, so we can try to both uh, motivate and then help support people who are, gonna, who are interested and we're going to step up and take that challenging step to be a leader in, in, in the community. You know, CC Yin had the vision and created a papa. 
And because the Papa was created here in, in Sacramento or, or California's ground zero, so I had a chance to see it firsthand. And there's nothing like it in the African American community or the Hispanic community. And, and it works. It's mentoring, finding our best and brightest future leaders, and it's so important. Um, I left city council last year, and a young man, Darren Soon, who is Chinese, had been talking for five years with me about running for my seat and taking my seat. And he took over for me last year on the city council seat. And recently, a Papa had a forum at the Capitol for potential candidates for state office. So Darren got to come and mentor me, or not mentor me, but sh job shadow me for a day and see my job as an assemblyman. And that's really what helps finding those good leaders out there. And there are good young leaders all over the place, but a forum to engage them and bring them inside and teach them the what, whys, and wheres. And organizations like Apapa, I mean, they, CC's done a great job with that. And we need more leaders like that in the minority community to make a difference. And it's so critical right now. Look at our numbers. And we have to have representation up there, folks that look like us and talk like us to make a difference and really address our issues. Otherwise, it doesn't get done. So, Cece, uh, my hat off to you. Uh, let me commend Assemblyman Cooper and Senator Pan for helping pass California's law that's going to automatically register people to vote at DMVs. Uh, that's a tremendous move forward. Uh, so getting more people registered to vote and then having people vote uh, is a huge game changer. If you can have more ethnic minorities uh, vote uh, and vote in high propensities, uh, that will start affecting policy changes. And if you look at you know, what Martin Luther King fought for, a lot of it was uh, for the ballot box, to make changes at the ballot box, get people to vote. And if uh, any of you can uh, help do that, it'll make a big difference. And all of us on this panel know that you know, when people campaign, not only do you ignore people who are not registered to vote, right, in terms of your mailers, in terms of targeting, you only end up focusing on people who actually are high propensity voters. So as a result, these folks end up having a disproportionate influence on government. So if we can get more people all across our communities registered to vote and then voting at high levels, uh, that would have a profound effect. And for those of you um, who are interested in government, uh, think about volunteering on a campaign. Uh, PABA does a great job with its internships. Uh, think about helping out uh, uh, during your summers. So there are things you can learn about government that might interest you to continue to pursue a path in government. I'm gonna try to tie four concepts quickly into responding. So, so the. The first is social identity, identity theory. People hang out and address and have a perspective of who they're comfortable with. Secondly, the winning breeds success. So people who watch winners oftentimes replicate it. Third is the combinatory theory of how, in linguistics, how people interact, create the next generation of ideas. So what I love about here is here we have Sacramento, we have Jim and Richard, right? They work together, they're really cooperative, they understand. But in my comments I mentioned, I didn't just say Asian Pacific Islander theory, because what they are is, and they're represented here in Sacramento, and Jim, I'm especially appreciative you're here, is that they reach out to everybody, right? So it ought not just to be Asians inspired by Asians, right? When I grew up, I was inspired by Martin Luther King and Cesar Chavez. Right, because there wasn't an Asian on TV that I could identify with. And so what we all have the power to do, and here's the fourth concept, politics is the exercise of power. Every day I feel we're blessed because we get to wake up, we can be inspired, we can work on how we make our friends, our families, our communities' lives better. Right? And that's what I want to share with all of us. Right. So by exercising your power, and it doesn't have to just be political power, you turn, turning around and recognizing somebody, sharing ideas, introducing them to somebody, working on the PTA, sharing faith in church, working on critical issues, will eventually change how we live and govern. So tie all those concepts, and that's how you build a more expansive opportunity for everybody. And then as we wrap up this conversation, Oh, did I miss someone? No. As we wrap up this conversation, I just wanted to ask, what will we see your name on in, as far as programs or legislation so we can keep an eye on you? 
So about 30 seconds, okay, for each answer. What, what are you going to spearhead? Very general question as we wrap things up. Do you want to start, Jim? That's a great question. Um, there, there's, it's, it's funny. We introduced over 4,000 pieces of legislation, and the governor only signed 800. So something that benefits California, and my passion really is our children, because we've been letting our children down in communities. So future legislation on that, something that makes it better, a better world, a better California for our young people. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The first bill I wrote and introduced in Congress was uh, to replicate basically California's climate change laws nationwide. And my view of how we solve this problem is we have America do what California has done and the rest of the world do what California has done. And that's how we have a better life for our children and, and your children. And also uh, the other issue I'm working on is to get the Attorney General of the United States to start investigating these cases where you do have uh, Asian Americans being falsely arrested and indicted for alleged espionage cases, only have all those charges dropped. Uh, two major things you're going to see unfold in the Treasurer's office is the, uh, we're, as I did with the state's financial data, I am going to post the state's debt data. Uh, we know that we got into the last fiscal trouble because America took on too much debt, whether it's the financial sector, whether it was government, whether it was the private sector. So we're going to highlight the state's financial debt so that we can me meaningfully tackle it. This is the real big issue for me. It's always been, that's why I run for financial offices. The inequality of opportunity in America, and especially as it relates to economics. So what, what's happening is that because we're losing manufacturing, the inconsistency of job hours, right, and the emergencies, whether it's healthcare emergencies or somebody's car breaks down, really puts people at the margins really in deep, deep trouble. So we're going to work on disclosing more of that data, but more importantly, coming up with different financial products and solutions so that we can get people through life without as much stress being overwhelmed, which oftentimes create greater mental health incidences in the state of California. Well, as a, certainly as a physician, I ran for the state senate to uh, keep uh, people safe and healthy. And uh, so I'm going to continue to work on that, particularly uh, we're going to continue to work on getting people health care coverage. I'm proud that we've basically, we, uh, We've been able, been able to expand, reduce the number of uninsured by over half in the state of California, expand coverage for, uh, uh, for, for immigrants uh, here in the state. Uh, we also, in addition to coverage, we have to make our health care actually work for people. So just having a coverage card isn't enough, and I've certainly led the fight on issues, for example, on what's going on with the Dental program and Medi-Cal program, be sure that they, they work for people. But it's not just about the health care part, if we're going to talk about health, it's also about how do we create healthier environments as well. How do we be sure the community is safer and healthier as well? So what are the things we can try to do to promote healthy lifestyles? That, uh, how do we create the, the built environment to support that as well? Uh, so that doesn't, it's not just about the health care, but it's also about how do we create healthier environments as well. And uh, that actually is part of the reason also I am uh, very actively supported the, uh, uh, the uh, package of uh, climate change bills that, that came through in the state of California, because I know that that has actually a significant health impact as well as multiple other impacts. And then finally, I have to as the uh, senator representing Sacramento, the other uh, major thing that I'm also focusing on is, is that the state government, we're the capital, very proud of that, but the state government is the largest employer. It's the largest landlord in our community. And any district in which someone's the largest employer and the largest landlord, we expect them to be a good citizen, to be, take a leadership role in the, uh, in the community they're in. And so I think the state of California needs to step up and take more of a, be a good citizen to the Sacramento region, and that uh, certainly as a member, I guess, of the legislature or the board of directors of sorts of this state, we need to do more to be sure that our state government is actually uh, doing right by the, by the city in which the headquarters is residing, and uh, so we're going to be working to, with uh, various agencies in state government about how do we promote healthier workplaces, how, what's the state's role in economic development for our local area as well here in Sacramento, given its large footprint and uh, many other issues related to that as well. So those are my priorities. Thank you. So once again, we want to thank the gentlemen here, our officials here, uh, State Treasurer John Chung. Thank you. Senator Richard Pan, Assemblymember Jim Cooper, and Congress Member Ted Liu.